Hey guys, welcome back to it. So in the background, I am going through and I am doing those, uh, all the rivets along those side skins, as I had mentioned, and I'm gonna to continue to work on that. Uh, nothing new, we've talked about it before. Everything is already match drilled. Every once in a while, I do have to run a drill bit through, just kind of line stuff back up, but there's no cutting involved. I could just as easily use an awl or something just to kind of line things up. In fact, that's not a bad idea. Uh, and then, <coughs> excuse me, I put in rivets and I do the work of riveting. I try to do as many as I can with a squeezer, but then there's a point at which about that far from any lip that I have to do everything else with bucking bars. And so that's what I'm doing in the background. So. Um, while that's going on, I thought I would talk to the video I made just a little bit ago about buying a used kit. Um, so I maintain what I said. I think buying, there's nothing wrong with buying a used kit. You're more than welcome to look at other people's work. In fact, uh, I know there is a prominent builder right now who is selling an RV 10, uh, and a kit rather, and there's no reason not to look at his work and maybe purchase it from him. Um, a lot of you in the comments, though, immediately leapt to the airman certificate and the 51% rule. And the reason I, I, ne I never mentioned that in my video, and the reason I never mentioned that in my video is a number of reasons. One, I think a lot of you don't understand what that means, and I'll get to that in a second. But the other thing is, the 51% rule, by its very nature, is um, kind of subjective in that First thing you have to do is establish where the 51% is. Now, the FAA has gone through in their infinite wisdom and per kit will describe to you in the document where they think the 51% mark is. Uh, I tried to find it for the RV-10 and I couldn't. I imagine this van has that, um, but I was not able to find it. If somebody does have that, link it down below, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but basically, what someone told me when I very first started this uh, was that when you finish putting all the metal together before you have got inside and started the wiring or, or any of the interior or any of that, you're still not at the 50% mark. <laughs> uh, now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I mean, there's, there's a heck of a long process here. So if somebody is selling a kit, usually they've got an empennage for sale, or they've got the empennage built and they've got a, the wings started, you're nowhere near 51%. But let's say, for example, they had 90% of the plane completed and you have to finish that last 10%. Could you get the airman certificate for that plane? Yes. The answer is yes. So now let's, let me explain. The way the 51% rule is described is that the, the plane must, it, it, it more defines the limitations against the manufacturers than it does against the builders. So to, for an experimental aircraft to get that certificate and for you to be able to get it, you have to prove that 51% of the plane was built by amateurs, not an individual, not me. So for example, if I got my plane 90% done and I sold it to you, you then could point to my videos and log and show that, look, 51 over 51% of this plane was built by an amateur. You finished it, thus you could get the Airman worthy, uh, Worthiness Certificate or the, the be able to, the, the uh, what's it called, the Airman, um, uh, whatever it's called. <laughs> you can get the certificate to be able to do the maintenance on it. Um, it's not an individual has to do 51%. It's that amateurs have to do 51% of it for recreation and education, I think is, is how it's described. Um, so that means, could you hire somebody? So for example, let's say um, my wings, I haven't closed up my wings. Uh, I'm busy working on this, and I want to hire my buddy Lynn to come over and work on this. Could I do that? Yeah. I, he could come over and finish it up. I give him 10 bucks to do it, right? Well, now that's not amateur work. That's professional work at that point because I've given him money. I've paid him to do it. But now if I said, hey, Lynn, would you please come over and work on my wings? I'm not going to give you a damn thing. We're amateurs. We're building this together. And he does it. 
Does it count? No. That's not, that would be part of my, that would be over the 51%. That means that, means that uh, that does not count as professional work. He is an amateur building it for his own education and for his own recreation. So at that point, that's not part of something that would count against you. Now, where you do have to look at it is, like, uh, you can get really nice wiring harnesses that are pre-built. That does count against you because that's built. You paid people money for that wiring harness, so that does count against that 51%. Um, I think my tips, my zip tips, which are really cool, by the way, because those are not the tips that came with the plane, but rather I bought them, those would count against me with that 51%. So I, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job of explaining this. I'm hoping that you understand what I'm saying. Um, it's not as hard of a rule as seems some of you think it is. It's actually fairly easy to prove that it was built by amateurs, if that makes sense. Um, like I said, if you bought a plane that was 90% completed, your burden to the FAA would be showing that, that more than 51% of it was completed by the former builder and you were finishing it out. Um, so and that you're good to go at that point because you're both amateurs. Um, so, and you would be eligible. I hope that explains it. Ultimately, it's just not a big deal. Uh, I think a lot of you, that's why I didn't mention it in, in the previous video because it just really wasn't relevant. It wasn't a thing to worry about. Um, if I'm wrong, so I'll, I'll try to link down below. Uh, I think EAA has some good documents on what the 51% stuff actually means. I'll try to link it down below if I think about it. Um, but ultimately, which would you rather have it built by? And I've talked to people about this before. When, when I tell them I'm building an airplane, they're always like, oh, you know, you're building an airplane, you're building your own coffin. No, no, no. Um, who would you rather have build your plane, an amateur or a professional? Have you ever had a, a Friday car or a Monday car? You know what I mean? It, like, a, like, just for whatever reason, like I, I had a car that it had electrical problems and there was no fixing it. And it was, I called it my Monday car. And the reason I called it my Monday car is because it was just always breaking down. Well, that car was built by professionals, right? Whereas, you know, this airplane, I'm building it, and I'm building it with care and diligence, and I truly enjoy it. And, I, and most amateurs are the same way. They love it. That's why they do it. The root word of amateur is amour, to love. So who would you rather have build something? A professional who's paid nine to five and doesn't really want to be there on Monday or Friday, he wants to get out as quickly as possible, or he had a beer, he's hungover or whatever, you know, he's just getting paid, doesn't mean he knows anything. Or a person who's doing it because they absolutely love it. I know which one I'd choose. Anyways, I hope that explains a little better the whole 51% thing. Again, the, the really the key is it has to be built by amateurs for recreation and education, not money. That's all that means. And if you can prove that, that you and whoever owned the kit before you did the 51%, then you're good to go. Really, that 51% is to put a limit on uh, like Vans aircraft themselves. So they can't basically deliver you a complete plane where you put one rivet in and, oh, you're good to go, it's experimental. No, you can't do that. That's what the 51% rule is. It's, it's to put a limit on them not on us. Okay, I'm gonna get back to it. Okay, so while I'm continuing working on the other side, I just thought I'd give you an update on this side. Uh, I've got just about everything done on this side that you're supposed to do. There are a few holes that are not done because it specifically says not to in the plans. Um, but for the most part, everything came out really nicely. I haven't done some of these down here just because reaching down over there and trying to do this number was super awkward. So I'm gonna have to get my wife out and have her come help me. And then these right here, same thing. It was just real awkward. So I'm gonna have her help me with those. And finally, this row along the bottom, there is no way you're gonna do that alone. I had pondered trying to think of some way I could put a back rivet plate up here and then do it from the inside, but even that, no. So this is one I'm gonna have to have the spousal unit come out and help me with. Uh, and of course, these along here you don't do yet until, uh, until you do the front. So 
all in all, I'm super happy with how everything came out. The one cheat I did was this rivet right here. I did use a blind rivet on this one. I actually upsized it to a 4-4 four uh, and used a blind rivet just because on the inside, it's impossible to get to, to where this rivet is with a bucking bar. I just don't have a way to get to it. So blind riveted that one, not a big deal. Totally gonna be fine. Everything else though, I'm real happy how's, how it came out. And I think I said in one of the previous videos that I was gonna do this back, that back, this front, that front. And it said, I got out here and I just got industrial and I just did this whole side. Uh, so yeah, really cool. I'm super happy what it looks like. Uh, the one thing that I did not do that I needed to do earlier was take the flooring out, which made some of this easier to get to. I hadn't taken it out yet. I'm not sure why I hadn't taken it out. It's not actually in the plans to take it out, but you obviously have to take it out to get access to some of this. So anyways, that's where I'm at on this side. And now back to work on that side. Nowhere near as bad as some places on the plane. I just wanted to show you inside here where you can see my giant bear paws trying to reach way down in here underneath uh, all the different bits of metal and uh, do some bucking. Kind of fun, but uh, not hard. If I can get in there, you can. So some of you have asked me why I use blue painter's tape when I put on the rivets. Well, uh, the reason used to be just when, you know, was in places where it would, the rivet would fall out. You know, you want something to hold it in while you're working, but there's actually a different reason now. And I'm gonna show you here. So first of all, is it faster to not use tape? Absolutely, let me show you. However, you pay for that speed with what the results look like. And so here you have a picture of the perfectly clean rivets that were done on the one side using blue painter's tape. And now this is a picture of what they look like without using the painter's tape. Now for sure, doing it without painter's tape is infinitely faster or tape of any, you know, rivet tape, infinitely faster than doing it without, but they look kind of ugly. So, Here's a picture of what it looks like after I did my best to clean it up using some acetone. Didn't make that big of a difference. I mean, is it a big deal? No, not really. And in fact, if you consider that the whole plane is gonna be painted, it's kind of a non-issue. But for me, being the pedantic, it needs to look neat guy, it really bugs me when the rivets look ugly. So that's why I use blue painter's tape. I, I will admit I'm starting to get away from doing it. Um, <clears throat> if you're using a squeezer, you absolutely don't need to use painter tape uh, because it doesn't create that ugly look. But for whatever reason, if you're using, if you're using the gun, it, it makes the rivet look crappy. So anyways, that's why I use painter's tape. Your mileage may vary. So somebody pointed out that Get in there. The uh, Vans Aircraft has released information on their website that the next version of the RV-10, I guess, is going to have... Ooh, that one didn't that one said correctly. Uh, that the next version of the RV-10 is going to have uh, completely uh, already match drilled holes. Um, so I know I buzz through a lot of this very quickly, uh, when I'm building, um, in a lot of ways, this is for me, not for y'all. Sorry. Uh, this is for, for my proof that I built the plane more than anything. Uh, I like answering questions and helping you guys out if I can, but I, I know I go quickly. You know, this is not a, this is not a how to show, uh, as much as it could be. I thought about doing, you know, more of that, making it more of a, uh, uh, an, ex a an exact how-to type show, but the amount of work that would go involved would be egregious. And ultimately, you know, the, the plans change so frequently that I don't know that I would be doing anyone a service. But um, someone pointed out that the next version of the plane will have holes that are already match drilled. So a lot of the drilling that you see me do, I mean, if there's already holes there, why do you have to drill? Because it's not quite a number 30 or a number 40 hole. It's ever so slightly smaller. And I think that was a lot to a allow for just a little bit of slop, a little bit of movement. Well, now apparently 
they're going to be drilling them to the final size, uh, which is amazing and awesome. And it tells me that they're confident enough in their machining that um, they know they're going to get it 100% right out of the gate. And it's really cool. So uh, yeah, it's going to save you a lot of time. It's going to be an awesome thing. And you know, Wish I had that, but I don't. So anyways, that is, a, that is a good thing. And it is, if you're like holding off because you're not sure if you want to do this, that's one reason to, like another reason why they're making your life a little easier. That'll actually, I'd be interesting to see how many hours that like takes off the plane. It'd be quite a bit. Because a, a lot of what you do is put on, get everything set, it, set match drill everything, take off, deburr, put back on to make sure everything's working or, or dimple and then put back on and then do more setting and you know, match drilling and whatnot and take off. I mean, there's just a lot of that. If everything is already assembled or everything is already match drilled for you, then the only thing you really have to do is assemble it, check to make sure it's right. You know, deburr, we have to deburr, pull it apart, dimple. If you have to put it back together and rivet it, you're done. So yeah, it's a, uh, that's a good thing. So good job, Vance. Okay, back to it. Anyway, guys, that's all I got in this one. I really appreciate you. If you like what I'm doing on this channel, if you do me a favor and like and subscribe down there or comment down below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, especially about what I had talked about in the, in the front of the video about the 51% thing. I'm always interested in what other people have to say. And if you really like what I'm doing, you can jump over to my Patreon page, link down below, and for as little as a dollar a month, you can help support this thing. Ultimately, if you guys want to buy your your own kit. You can build one of these. If I can build one, you can build one. And if you use my builder's number, which is also down below, Van, send me a hundred bucks. It's no money out of your pocket. Anyways, thanks guys. I'll talk at you next time.